Hi, this is Dr. Vallesh. Welcome to Pharmacology Simplified. In this video, I am going to speak about calcium channel blockers as anti-anginal drugs. This very important topic will be asked in your theory exam, practical exams, especially prescription writing exercises, viva and of course in your entrance exams. Now apart from this video, I have prepared other videos for anti-anginal drugs as well. One is about the pathophysiology of anti-anginals, uh, pathophysiology of angina and the principles of management of angina. Second one is about nitrates. Another one is about beta blockers and this is the next video in the same series. Now any drugs you need to describe in pharmacology under some headings, you already know this by this time, introduction, classification and other headings. Let us uh, explore calcium channel blockers under the same headings. And before that we need to classify anti-anginal drugs. Anti-anginal drugs, there are four major groups, nitrates, long acting, short acting ones, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers and other anti-anginal drugs. For this video, we are concerned about the calcium channel blockers. The introduction of calcium channel blockers, they are frontline anti-anginal drugs and they are used in the chronic treatment of all types of angina pectoris. Contrast this with nitrates. Nitrates are also frontline anti-anginal drugs but they are used for acute treatment of all types of angina pectoris. That is the difference between nitrates and calcium channel blockers. Nitrates are used for acute treatment for, of all types of angina. Calcium channel blockers are used for chronic treatment of all types of angina. Beta blockers are not used in uh, all types of angina. They are not used in vasospastic angina. Remember this. Now, classification of calcium channel blockers, uh, there are two major groups, dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. Uh, if you want, you can remember the different uh, uh, chemical names of the non-dihydropyridines as well, phenylalkylamine and benzocyabutene. But for practical purposes, it is sufficient if you remember these two groups, dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines. It is very, very important that you know that these two groups are there uh, because these two groups differ in their pharmacological actions, their, uh, in their effects. All the things are different between these two group of drugs. Dihydropyridines, uh, all the dipins, nifidipin, amlodipin, silnidipin, benidipin are all dihydropyridines. Amlodipin perhaps is the most popular of the dihydropyridines. Now, when it comes to non-dihydropyridines, we have verapamil which is a phenylalkylamine and diltiazem which is a benzothiazepine. Now, remember diltiazem is a benzothiazepine. There is another similar group of drugs called benzodiazepines. Example for a benzodiazepine is diazepam. Remember this very important difference. Benzothiazepine is diltiazem. You can see the T into the both of the names there. Diltiazem is a benzothiazepine which is used, used in cardiovascular system. Whereas diazepam is a benzodiazepine useful in CNS as a sedative hypnotic agent. Please do not confuse this. So this is the classification. Moving on, next heading is the mechanism of action. As the name itself suggests, calcium channel blockers block some type of calcium channels. Which type of calcium channels uh, are these? There are different types of calcium channels, L type, N type, LN, T, P, Q, or all these different types of calcium channels are there. Out of all these, calcium channel blockers block the L type voltage gated calcium channels. So with this, if the L type voltage gated calcium channels are blocked, calcium cannot enter the cell on which this calcium channel is located. And the most important locations for the L-type calcium channels are the three types of muscles, myocardial, uh, myocardial muscle, vascular smooth muscle and other smooth muscles. They are also present in the skeletal muscles but the calcium channel blockers do not affect that much the L-type calcium channels that are located in the skeletal muscles. Apart from that, we are having myocardium and smooth muscles, vascular smooth muscles and other smooth muscles. In all these three locations, the L-type calcium channels are required for excitation contraction coupling. Whenever there is excitation of the muscle, there is opening up of these L-type calcium channels and calcium enter, calcium uh, uh, ions enter the uh, cell, whether it is myocardial, uh, uh, myocardium or whether it is smooth muscle located in the blood vessels or extravascular smooth muscle. The calcium enters inside and after the calcium enters the smooth muscle or the uh, uh, cardiac muscle, there is contraction. This is called as excitation contraction coupling. The calcium is required for excitation contraction coupling. In other words, if calcium is there, all these muscles will undergo contraction. What will happen if L-type calcium channels are blocked? The calcium will not enter the cell, correct? So if calcium does not enter the cell, what is going to happen? Opposite of contraction, that is relaxation. So relaxation in the myocardium will lead to myocardial depression. Relaxation in the vascular smooth muscle will lead to vasodilatation. Relaxation in other smooth muscles lead to various other effects. Now, L-type voltage gated calcium channels are also located in the cardiac conducting system. 
especially in the SA node and AV node. They are also located on the Purkinje cells as well, Purkinje fibers as well. But especially in the SA node, AV node, uh, L-type calcium channels are located. Here, they serve a different purpose. They are responsible for phase 0 of pacemaker potential. What is this phase 0 of pacemaker potential and what is the cardiac action potential? That is a topic for a different video. Here, I will just recapitulate. This is pacemaker action potential. There are two types of action potentials. This action potential is seen in pacemaker cells, SA node, AV node, Purkinje, bundle of this, all these uh, uh, fibers. This type of action potential is seen. Here you can see phase 0 is there. There is no phase 1, there is no phase 2 directly, there is phase 3, then there is phase 4, again there is phase 0. Phase 0 of pacemaker action potential, calcium is moving inside. Whereas phase 0 of myocyte action potential, sodium is moving inside. That is an important difference. I uh, will cover that in a different video. Here it is, it suffice to say, say that phase 0 of pacemaker action potential, calcium is entering inside and through where the calcium is entering inside, it is through the L-type calcium channels. Now, if L-type calcium channels are blocked here, what is going to happen? Calcium does not enter and as a result, heart rate is going to fall that is called as bradycardia. Now, the most important effects in the heart as you can see here, one is myocardial depression. Again, bradycardia is a form of myocardial depression, that is the first one. Second one is vasodilatation. So, these are the two major actions of calcium channel blockers in the heart. That is cardiac depression, and second one is vasodilatation. So, cardiac action is cardiac depression, vascular action is vasodilatation. I told you the classification of uh, calcium channel blockers is very, very important because uh, the two groups of drugs differ everywhere uh, with respect to the action, with respect to the outcome, everything. So, let us see how it is important here. Remember, the cardiac action, that is cardiac depression, is more prominent with the non-DHPs, whereas vascular action is more prominent with the DHPs. This is something that you need to remember. If you remember this, everything else becomes very easy. The cardiac action is more often seen with DHPs, uh, non-DHPs, whereas vascular action is seen with DHPs. So, Non-DHPs have cardiac action more than vascular action, DHPs have vascular action more than cardiac action. Now, even within the non-DHPs, we are having verapamil and diltiazem, right? Now, verapamil and diltiazem are like brothers, younger brother, elder brother. Verapamil is the elder brother, diltiazem is like the younger brother. Whatever verapamil does, diltiazem also does, but with less efficacy. Remember this concept very well, okay? Now, so I told you that verapamil and diltiazem have cardiac action more than vascular action. And verapamil is stronger than diltiazem. So, with this, uh, these uh, inputs uh, you can easily tell which drug is having uh, more uh, stronger cardiac depression, which is having moderate, which is having weak. Verapamil should have strong cardiac depression. And vascular action is mild, right? So it should have moderate vas uh, the, uh, vasodilatation. And diltiazem is the younger brother of verapamil. So whatever verapamil does, it does it mildly. So cardiac depression, verapamil strong, diltiazem should be moderate. Vasodilatation, verapamil moderate, diltiazem should be weak. Next, dihydropyridines, they have vascular action strongly than the cardiac action. So, vasodilatation should be strong with dihydropyridines, whereas cardiac depression is weak. Remember this concept very well, uh, uh, we'll uh, elaborate up upon this in subsequent slides. Now, with these, uh, this information, we can actually grade the uh, cardiac depression and vasodilatation. So, cardiac depression strong to weak, verapamil and diltiazem followed by dihydropyridines. Vasodilatation from strong to weak, strongest is dihydropyridines followed by verapamil and diltiazem. Remember the relation between verapamil and diltiazem. Diltiazem always is weaker when compared to verapamil. Now, these are the actions, two major actions, cardiac action and vascular actions. Because of these two actions, the calcium channel blockers have various effects. This has anti-anginal effect, anti hypertensive effect, anti-arrhythmic effect. Look at the progression. These are calcium channel blockers. The mechanism of action is blocked of calcium channel, L-type calcium channel. That is a mechanism of action. That is responsible for the action. That is cardiac depression and vasodilatation. The action is responsible for the effect. What is the effect? Anti-anginal effect, anti hypertensive effect, anti-arrhythmic effect. Mechanism of action leads to action. Action leads to effect. This relation is very clearly uh, explainable if you remember the calcium channel blockers. So, let us further dissect the cardiac depression and vasodilatation. So, cardiac depression due to calcium channel blockers, uh, 
by inhibiting calcium influx into the myocardial cells leading to reduced force of contraction and it will also inhibit the calcium influx into SA node AV node that is the conducting system that will lead to decrease in heart rate reduced cardiac conduction all these things that is reduced force of contraction reduced heart rate reduced conduction is seen because of cardiac depression on the other hand vasodilatation is seen because of inhibition of calcium influx into the vascular smooth muscle that will lead to vasodilatation of both arteries and arterioles understood so we, we can uh, remember this side by side and throughout this video i have used red color for cardiac depression and blue color for vasodilatation moving on uh, again this is more of a uh, recapitulation strength of cardiac depression verapamil diltiazem dihydropyridines on the other hand strength of vasodilatation verapamil diltiazem dihydropyridines so cardiac depression strongest cardiac depression is seen with verapamil moderate uh, cardiac depression is seen with diltiazem and dihydropyridines have weak cardiac depression on the other hand vasodilatation strongest vasodilatation is seen with the seen with dihydropyridines moderate is seen with verapamil weak is seen with diltiazem understood so this concept is very very important that is the reason why i have repeated this in, in uh, two slides moving on this is a very very important slide the comparison between nitrates and calcium channel blockers when it comes to vasodilatation remember nitrates are also vasodilators calcium channel blockers are also vasodilators but how they uh, do the vasodilatation and which vessels are affected is very very important now, vessels affected nitrates if you remember nitrates are venodilators more than arteriodilators whereas calcium channel blockers is just the opposite arteries more than veins another very important point perhaps this is the most important point of all small arterioles are not affected by nitrates but calcium channel blockers dilate both large arteries and small arterioles this is very very important and because of this because small arteries arterioles are not dilated by the nitrates coronary artery regulation is not affected by the nitrates on the other hand because calcium channel blockers dilate the small arterioles as well calcium channel blockers interfere with the coronary autoregulation and perhaps this is the reason why coronary steel phenomenon is not seen with nitrates whereas coronary steel phenomenon is seen with calcium channel blockers especially the short acting ones short acting calcium channel blockers such as nifedipine previously sublingual nifedipine was given for various uh, conditions including angina because of this observation that nifedipine sublingual short acting nifedipine leads to coronary steel phenomenon that will lead to adverse outcomes and that is the reason why we no longer use sublingual uh, nifedipine for uh, uh, acute management of angina for that we use sublingual nitro nitroglycerin this is very important please remember this moving on so we have seen the mechanism of action we have seen the action let us look at the effect the first uh, most important effect is anti anginal effect and that is the topic of this video so anti anginal effect of calcium channel blockers if you remember uh, whenever we are speaking about anti anginal drugs we need to bring in two concepts that is myocardial oxygen demand myocardial oxygen supply now uh, on the one hand calcium channel blockers produce peripheral arterial dilatation because of that there is fall in blood pressure If the blood pressure is reduced there is reduction in after load and because of that myocardial workload or myocardial work is reduced that is on the one hand secondly because of the direct action on the heart they produce cardiac depression now remember the first one peripheral arterial dilatation is more often seen with dihydropyridines remember dhks have vascular more than cardiac action the second one direct cardiac depression is more often seen with non dhp such as verapamil diltiazem but because of both of these actions there is reduced myocardial work leading to reduced myocardial oxygen demand this is the rationale behind using calcium channel blockers in classical angina the classical angina is there you can use both dihydropyridines and verapamil however we use dihydropyridines more than verapamil in management whenever we are using uh, calcium channel blockers in angina it is more often dihydropyridines such as amlodipine and other drugs this is on the one hand next we also know that calcium channel blockers dilate arteries especially the coronary arteries they produce coronary vasodilatation in the proximal segment of the coronary artery that will lead to relief of vasospasm if it is present now, this is the rationale behind using calcium channel blockers in another type of angina which is that that is vasospastic angina because it will increase the myocardial blood supply if there is vasospasm the angina is because of that 
there is a rationale for using calcium channel blockers for the management of that type of angina which is rhesusphastic angina the problem is the problem is calcium channel blockers do not stop with relaxing the proximal larger segment of the arteries they also relax the distal smaller arterioles and because of that calcium channel blockers especially the short acting ones will lead to coronary steel phenomenon remember this and uh, as i told you earlier for the management of angina we use dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers more often than the verapamil and diltiazem the non dhps we use dhps more than non dhps this is the anti angina effect other cardiovascular effects also are there anti arrhythmic effect and anti hypertensive effect if you see these two effects anti arrhythmic effect is more often because of the direct cardiac action whereas anti hypertensive effect is more of a vascular action than the cardiac action now if you have followed uh, me till this point you can very easily tell which group of calcium channel blockers are used for anti arrhythmic effect which group is used for anti hypertensive effect so anti arrhythmic effect cardiac action which group should be used is it dhps or non dhps it should be non dhps verapamil diltiazem is more often used than dhp that is the reason why verapamil is a drug of choice for which arrhythmia it is a drug of choice for psvt paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia on the other hand anti hypertensive effect it is a vascular action so dhps are more often used when compared to verapamil diltiazem that is the reason why the front line drugs for management of hypertension a b c d b is no longer there what is c calcium channel blockers which calcium channel blockers this dhps especially we use amlodipine for anti hypertensive effect 